Today's unit is going to be on cell biology, so we'll discuss the structure and the functions of cells. Cells, as we know, are going to be the smallest unit of living things. They have the ability to reproduce, they can metabolize, they can, they can move, they can adapt, and they can create waste products. Knowing all of this, it's going to be very important to know that there needs to be a large surface-to-volume ratio when it comes to a cell. So some animals are going to be considered unicellular organisms. That's going to be your prokaryotes and some protists. Other organisms like animals and, of course, humans, we're going to be multicellular organisms. So that means we're made up of many different cells and different types of cells, which we're going to discuss later on with histology. So with this surface-to-volume ratio, it's going to be very important that we have a lot of surface area. The main reason is, is when a cell produces its waste products or if it needs to get substances into the cell in order to do the different functions like the met metabolic functions that it needs to do, it needs to get that across the cell membrane into those areas very quickly. Also, in order to get rid of the waste products, it's going to need to get those out of that cell very quickly. So the larger that cell is, the more area it's going to have to cover in order to get those things in and to get those things out. So the smaller the cell, the better it is. It, it will be way more efficient and be able to get those things in and out very quickly, and that's going to help that cell function better overall. So being small gives the cell the following advantages. Like I said, you have faster rates of diffusion. That's things coming in and things going out. Um, better rates of osmosis. That's simply the diffusion of water. And you're going to have other kinds of transport, such as nutrients coming in and waste removal going out. It's able to get rid of heat very efficiently, so anytime you have metabolic functions going on, usually at the mitochondria creating ATP, it is going to create heat, so it needs to be able to get rid of that heat very efficiently. Also, it's able to produce enough energy to run that cell. So like we said, that mitochondria is going to be the organelle that is responsible for producing that energy and making ATP. Also, materials and resources are going to be adequate enough to meet that cell's needs if it's small. And looking here, you see overall, this is going to be your eukaryotic cell here. Eukaryotic means it is going to be a cell that has a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. If we're talking prokaryotic cells, you learned that in regular biology, that's simply going to be a cell that has no nucleus, the DNA is just floating around, and no membrane-bound organelles other than a ribosome. So looking here, it shows you your basic cell structures, and we're going to talk about these. And so you see the nucleus. Inside the nucleus is going to contain chromatin, which is going to be your DNA in its natural form when it's not going through mitosis and condensed into chromosomes. It has a nucleolus that's going to be responsible for making ribosomes, and it's going to be contained in a nuclear envelope. That's going to surround that cell and make sure that it um, regulates what goes in and what comes out, just like the cell membrane. You also have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is often going to be abbreviated as the ER. And so we'll talk about the rough ER and the smooth. Basically, rough ER is going to help with making and producing proteins. Smooth ER has got a bunch of functions we're going to talk about, for example, lipid creation and cholesterols, and also detoxifying things. You have a flagellum which is going to be found on the outside of the cell attached to the cell membrane. Now, in humans, the flagellum is only going to be found on the sperm cell. Centrosomes are going to be here. You're going to find that they're going to be what makes up the centriole. Those centrioles will go to the poles during mitosis and create spindle fibers, which are going to help those chromosomes separate and pull that cell apart in order to make two daughter cells. You see that you have peroxisomes there. They're actually going to be um, vacuoles that contain their own form of um, enzymes that are going to break things down. You see that it has microvilli. This is going to increase surface area in order to increase the rate of absorption that's going to come into that cell. And of course, not all cells are going to have all of these things, but most cells will have most of these organelles. For example, not all cells have like a flagellum or microvilli. Um, microfilaments, these are going to help in creating the um, cytoskeleton. Also, they consist of intermediate filaments and microtubules. All that makes up that cytoskeleton, which is basically the structure that kind of gives the cell its shape and acts as a skeleton for the cell. 
Ribosomes are going to be the main protein um, producers inside of that cell. The Golgi apparatus is going to be responsible for sorting and packaging and modifying those things, those proteins. The plasma membrane is going to be the cell membrane. That's what's going to surround the cell and keep the outside environment separate from the inside environment and regulate what comes in and out of the cell. Then you have the mitochondria, which is going to be what we often refer to as the powerhouse of the cell. That's going to be where most metabolism takes place inside of the cell and ATPs are made, your energy molecule. And then, of course, your lysosomes. Lysosomes are going to be vacuoles that are filled with enzymes. Actually, there's about 50 different types of enzymes that can be in there. And they will help to break down and dissolve things and get rid of things that that cell does not need. So going in with these organelles. Organelles are going to be simply small organs in the cell that have specific jobs. We discussed that nucleus. The nucleus is kind of considered the brain of the cell. Its job is to house most of the organism's genes, which are going to be found on strands of DNA. They are going to synthesize and assemble ribosomes inside of the nucleus, and that's going to actually occur in the nucleolus. And um, with the synthesization of that, um, it also is going to create messenger RNA, or what's referred to as mRNA, and that's where it's going to come in and actually make copies of the genes that are found on the DNA, and then send those out to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm to actually produce the protein of the gene that it copied. So the structure is going to be a double bound membrane, and so with your regular cell membrane that goes around the cell, it's a double phospholipid bilayer. Well, with this one, it's actually going to be two of those double phospholipid bilayers. So technically, it's made up of four layers of a phospholipid membrane. It is going to be porous, so it will have nuclear pores throughout, which will allow certain things in and certain things out. So looking here, you can see the nucleus in this picture. It is going to show you the nucleolus in the center. It has the pores that you see around the membrane, that nuclear membrane, and that will allow different things in and out. And notice how the endoplasmic reticulum, in this case, it's going to be the rough endoplasmic reticulum that's attached. Right. And so this organization is going to help segregate the materials from the actual inside of the cell from that inside of the nucleus. So it keeps those things separated. The mRNA, rRNA, building materials, proteins, and ATP can then also travel in and out through these nuclear pores in order to do what they need to do inside of the nucleus or to travel outside of the cell to work within the cell. So looking here at the cell, the cell is being prepared for division. Once it starts to prepare for division, the chromatin is going to condense itself. As it condenses itself, it's going to wrap itself around proteins called histones. And so you'll see that here in the picture. They look like little blue um, pop beads or beads. And so it wraps around these beads and creates a condensed form called a chromosome. Those chromosomes have what are known as centromeres in the center of it that's going to connect the two chromosomes, and they have kinetochore right there at that centromere of each chromosome. And so there's your visible chromosome. Now lots of people think of chromosomes as being X's, but actually a chromosome will be um, made up of those two sister chromatids. And of course you get one from your mother and you get one from your father. And so those will work together in order to help produce the genes and the things that you see that are exhibited in your cell or your body, different characteristics. Now, looking at this chromosome, you can see how it is super coiled around that area, and you see those histones that it's coiled around. And so the actual DNA is going to be the yellow strands. And as it gets bigger and you can look at it, you see that it has the different colors going through the center that are going to make up the rungs of the lat. Those are actually going to be your nitrogenous bases that are the center part. Now the sides of the ladder, once you look at it closer, are going to simply be made up of a deoxyribose sugar and then a phosphate. And so those are going to be very strong bonds on the side, very weak bonds going through the center that are going to be found between the nitrogenous bases. So the ribosomes are going to be there in order to read the DNA. 
it changes over into mRNA, and then that mRNA goes to the ribosome as a blueprint. So as it's reading it, it's going to send out tRNAs, or what's referred to as transfer RNAs, in order to pick up amino acids that are going to match up with the DNA. It reads the DNA three at a time, which are referred to as codons, and brings back the actual matching amino acid to that. The structure of the ribosome is going to be composed of what's referred to as rRNA and protein. And so the rRNA stands for ribosomal um, RNA. The mRNA stood for messenger RNA. So with the rRNA, it's going to be composed of two subunits. They aren't surrounded by a membrane. So these two subunits will come together when it's time to read a strand of mRNA, and the mRNA will go through the two subunits of rRNA. And so looking here, you see, so you see the large subunit and you see the small subunit. And so the mRNA strand will go between the two and it's going to read it three at a time. Those three are referred to as codons. A tRNA or transfer RNA will have anticodons. It goes out in search of an amino acid, brings it back, and hooks it together with a peptide bond. Sometimes you'll have ribosomes that are going to be bound to another structure. They're attached to the nuclear membrane of an endoplasmic reticulum, and it makes it have a rough looking structure. So that's where it's going to get its name, rough ER or rough endoplasmic reticulum. So it's going to make proteins that are going to be inserted into the membrane and exported outside of the cell, or it's going to be packaged into lysosomes. Free ribosomes are going to be ribosomes that are simply just floating around in the cytoplasm, or sometimes it's referred to as cytosol. These are going to help make proteins that are going to function in the cytosol as enzymes. So bacterial ribosomes are going to be much smaller than eukaryotic ribosomes. Um, antibiotics can inactivate these bacterial ribosomes without hurting the eukaryotic cell. And so this actually, if it turns off its way to make proteins that it needs, this will in turn end up destroying that bacteria. So this is going to be how some antibiotics will work. And so looking at the structure, you see how the mRNA or the proteins, the ribosomes, can travel out to different parts of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum, often, like we said, it's referred to as the ER, is going to be a network of tubules and sacs. It's going to create internal compartments. And if you saw the picture that we just looked at, you'll see how these internal endomembranous system is connected and how it sends products out throughout that cell and outside of the cell. So with the two types, we kind of discussed the rough endoplasmic already. That rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to be referred to as rough because it's going to have ribosomes attached to that outside, which make it look bumpy. It's going to be involved, like we said, in making proteins that will be secreted and attached to a cell membrane or for use within that cytosol or cytoplasm. It actively will help also make more membrane. And so there you see the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Notice how it has the red ribosomes attached to it that give it that rough structure or feature. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have ribosomes bound to it, and so it looks like it's more of a smooth membrane structure. That structure is going to synthesize lipids. Lipids, of course, are going to be your fats, your sterols, waxes, things like that. So it's going to make phospholipids, which will make up the cell membrane. It'll make up steroids, which are going to be hormones the body's going to use. It makes up cholesterols, and it makes up your triglycerides. Right. It's going to synthesize and store glycogen, um, and you're going to find a lot of these in the liver and muscle because that's where glycogen is going to be stored in animals, or specifically humans. Glycogen is basically a human starch, or a way that we store glucose in our body. So if your body needs to bring your blood sugar up and you haven't had anything to eat, what it's going to do is it's going to go to the liver or it's going to go to the muscle and it's going to change this glycogen over in, 
release it from the liver or muscle into the bloodstream to bring, to bring your blood sugar back up. Now with the smoothie yard, it's also going to be known for absorbing, storing, and releasing calcium ions. It also is great at detoxifying or inactivating drugs and poisons. So liver cells are going to increase their smooth ER when they're exposed to things such as alcohol and poisons. And they're also going to be responsible for tolerance of drugs. Now, the more you drink coffee, caffeine's considered a drug and your body has to take that apart and get rid of it. Or the more that you drink soft drinks with high um, caffeine content or energy drinks, or if you take Tylenol a lot or any type of medication or drink alcohol, the more ER that your body's going to have in the liver, specifically smooth ER, because this is going to be the organelle that's responsible for breaking down and detoxifying these substances. And so the more that you have, the quicker it's able to respond to these substances when they are found in the body or when they come into the body. So this leads to tolerance. The more smooth ER you have, the higher tolerance you will have for specific um, medications and things. So I am a big coffee drinker. I drink lots of coffee, therefore I take in lots of caffeine in the morning. So my body would have a lot of smooth ER in the liver. And so if I were to get hurt and needed a medication to help, let's say with pain or something, it might take a little bit more because my body's already going to have a lot of those smooth ER, which will break that medication down a lot faster. And so I'll have a higher tolerance than somebody who, let's say, doesn't drink a lot of caffeine or take any medications. The Golgi apparatus is going to be there to modify store, sort, and ship products coming from that endoplasmic reticulum. So the structure is also going to be a membranous um, structure. It looks like a stack of flattened membrane sacs, often referred to as a stack of pancakes sometimes with some pictures. It's going to have two faces. It has what's called a cis forming and then a trans or eroding structure. And so looking here, the um, side that's going to be the cis or receiving side is the side where those proteins are going to come in to the Golgi apparatus. Once they get in there, they're going to modify those proteins. They're going to sort those proteins according to like. And then once all the ones that are alike each other are ready to be shipped out, they make their way through the membrane system as they're being processed. And then they're going to exit through the trans face or the shipping face. Basically, it's going to enclose it into a vesicle, so it surrounds it with a vesicle part of that membrane, and it's going to ship it out. And so markers on the surface of vesicles are going to aid in sorting these things and sending these vesicles to various parts of that cell. Lysosomes are going to be there to contain different types of chemicals. These are going to be enzymes within it. So they contain things like hydrolytic enzymes, which aid in digesting uh, macromolecules. So you'll have proteases, nucleases, and carbohydrates. They um, immune System cells there will help kill pathogenic organisms by using lysosomes. So basically, they can dump the acidic content of that lysosome onto a organism such as a parasite and destroy it. They have what's referred to as autophagy. This is recycling old or worn out cell parts that it needs to get rid of. So it kind of acts like a trash can structure or disposal system. And basically, its structure is going to be a membrane-bound sac that's created by the Golgi apparatus. And so it's just going to be like a little bubble or a little container within the cell that contains these enzymes that will do specific things. All right. So they will have a low pH inside. Um, they have a protective mechanism in case of leakage. So the protein inside these enzymes that are going to be found are deactivated by the pH of the cytosol. So if they start to leak, they become deactivated and it's not going to harm that cell. And so looking here, you see how the rough ER is going to make a protein. It transports that protein to the Golgi apparatus. That Golgi apparatus then sorts, modifies, and um, 
puts together all of the things that need to go together, it will then encase it in its own vesicle and create that lysosome there. That lysosome could be used to help in aiding and digesting food products that come into the cell, or it could be helped in taking in old worn out parts. Let's say we have an old mitochondria, which is shown here in the picture, that needs to be broken down. It's no longer working properly. So it releases those enzymes that are going to digest and break down and reabsorb the nutrients from that old worn out mitochondria and get rid of it so it's no longer gunking up that cell. So vacuoles are going to be membrane bound sacs um, they're going to be larger than the vesicles, and some of their jobs will be such as food vacuoles. That will be um, a way for food to come into the cell. And so looking at this picture, let's say food particles come up against the side of the cell. They start to cause an indentation at the cell membrane. That cell membrane slowly starts to wrap itself around that food particle and then brings it into the cell. As it does that, it keeps part of that cell's membrane around the food and that makes it kind of like its own little circular structure and that's what's referred to as the vacuole. When it brings it into the cell through this, it's a type of endocytosis and since it is a solid material, it's referred to as phagocytosis. If it were a liquid coming in, it would be penocytosis. And so this is going to be a very important defense um, mechanism against invading organisms because it needs to be wrapped within that cell membrane and then it's going to start to break it down and handle that substance as it comes in um, on a specific basis. All right, so the mitochondria. The structure of the mitochondria, mitochondria is that it's going to be a sac within a sac, often is what it's referred to. So this means it's enclosed by two membranes. So there's a membrane, and then there's another structure within it that's going to be another membrane system. Uh, mitochondria does have its own DNA, and it's referred to as mtDNA. So if you've ever done a DNA test, you might see a section of the DNA referred to as your mtDNA. This would be your mitochondrial DNA. And a cool um, thing about this is that your mitochondrial DNA matches the DNA of your mother. And so technically, DNA is split 50-50. You have 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 from dad, but the mitochondria, all your mitochondria in your body, will have this mtDNA, which matches your mom's. So you'll have slightly more of your mother's DNA than you will of your father's DNA. And that's because of this mitochondria. It also leads to what's referred to as an endosymbiosis theory. And that's where a long time ago it was thought that bacteria were enclosed or brought into the cell through a type of endocytosis or phagocytosis and that bacteria then went along and helped that cell out to perform a function or to help it with energy but it kept its own dna and so that's the theory behind how the mitochondria came to be is actually used to be a bacteria so it does have its own dna it does not have the dna that's found in the nucleus of your cells um, it's going to house many enzymes and its job basically is to function in cellular respiration. That's going to be the breakdown of food in order to make energy. And your energy molecule is going to be your ATP molecule. So looking here, you can see the structure of the mitochondria. It often is referred to as looking like a um, bean or a kidney bean. If you look at the inside, you'll see that you have the outer membrane structure and within you have an inner membrane structure. Next, we have the peroxisomes. The peroxisomes are going to break down fatty acids and they make hydrogen peroxide in the process and that's going to help catalyze and break other things down. They also help detoxify alcohol and other harmful substances, so these will work along with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Their structure basically is going to be one membrane that's going to be bound together. And if you look here, you can see the peroxisome that's going to be inside of a cell. Next we have our cytoskeleton. The function of the cytoskeleton is to support the shape of the cell and it also provides anchorage for organelles and enzymes within that cell. It provides for a cell to have certain substances or certain things that are going to move along that cell membrane or along not cell membrane but the cytoskeleton and it 
that's going to um, actually attaches whatever substance needs to move onto what's known as motor proteins, and they're going to use that cytoskeleton as a roadway in order to move it from place to place throughout the cell. And so they'll attach on, let's say, to a vesicle of some sort. You'll have the motor proteins come in, and they'll kind of actually work as legs and walk across that cytoskeleton and get to the point of the cell that it needs to get to. So make its way across the cell or from one side to the other or just to a certain point. And so here you can see the some of the cytoskeleton that's coming out of the cell. It also helps shape plasma membrane during phagocytosis. So it helps to form that plasma membrane that's going to create that vacuole or the vesicle around whatever's coming in. And here you're seeing different types of microtubules, microfilaments, and how some of them are thick. The microtubules are going to be much thicker than the microfilaments. And here you see the different, basically, roadways that that cytoskeleton's making. And with the microvilli, it actually even help give the microvilli its structure, so it helps it stand up and be a more absorbent type um, surface that's going to be on the outside. So you see these microfilaments coming up through the microvilli, which are going to help keep them um, in their shape, basically. Cilia are going to be short hair-like extensions that are going to be found on the surface of the cell. They're going to be very, very numerous. They often, like we said, refer to as hair-like structures or look like they're in tufts. They do have an oar-like motion, so their job is to move things. Lots of times they will have cells underneath that will produce a mucus, so you will find these types of cells in the respiratory tract. And so the hairs will capture um, debris that you breathe in in that mucus, and then the cilia hairs will actually act in an oar-like motion in order to get those up and away from the respiratory tract so they don't get into the lungs and cause any type of infection. You'll also find them in the um, reproductive system of females. These cilia are actually used in order to move the egg along the fallopian tube to the uterus. Next, we have the flagella. The flagella is going to be a long whip-like extension on the surface of a cell. You're only going to have a few of these, and like I said, this is only going to be found in humans on a sperm cell. They're going to provide for undulating motion, so it's going to be able to help it get from point A to point B. And this is what it actually looks like. We have a picture that someone's drawn versus the actual thing underneath a microscope and that would be probably an electron scanning microscope. With the cilia, you see that on the picture that's gonna be on the bottom picture, and you see those hair-like structures, and they're gonna move in an oar-like or stroke-like manner. Next, we'll go into the cell, cell membrane structure and function. So basically, the cell membrane is going to be a universal component of all cells. Basically, it's very important because that's what differentiates that it's a cell. It's going to keep the outside environment outside and the inside environment inside. So different membrane parts. You're going to have the phospholipids. This is going to contain hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. And so looking here at this picture, the hydrophobic region is going to be the lipid tail that it's pointing at. The hydrophi hydrophilic region, or the region that loves water, is going to be the phosphate head. And it's kind of a glycerol phosphate head. And so that is pointing to the glycerol phosphate head. And then, of course, your fatty acid tails. So they are saturated, viscous, and unsaturated is going to be fluid. Proteins are going to be um, a big part of cells. You have one that's called an integral protein. And so you see the structure here it's pointing at. That is going to be in between the layer of the cell membrane. And so it has a actual hydrophobic region to it. That hydrophobic region is going to be the center part, which is going to line up with the hydrophobic center or regions of the phospholipid. And then it has a hydrophilic region, which are going to be both ends of that protein, which are going to be located near the glycerol phosphate head. So next we have what's referred to as peripheral proteins. The peripheral proteins are going to help with um, attaching like to the cytoskeleton. 
And so they, they will be there to help out those integral proteins as well. You have transport proteins. Those are going to be ones that function to bring things in and out of the cell. You have enzymic activity proteins. These are the ones that activate with different enzymes. You have signal transduction. So they actually rely on signals that will come in. So a specific thing will come into a um, activation site and actually signal it to bring something in. You have intercellular joining. So these will attach two cells together. You have cell recognition. These are going to be very important because it lets the cell um, know if that cell belongs. So it puts a specific protein on the cell membrane that says, hey, I belong here, kind of like a fingerprint. So the immune system knows not to attack it. You have an attachment to the cytoskeleton in that intracellular matrix there that you see at the bottom one. So that's the ECM. Cholesterols, these are going to be very important because this is what's going to help make up the cell membrane. And also it's going to be the basis for a lot of the hormones within the body. So at high temperatures also, when you find the cholesterols, let's see, let's go back to the picture for a minute. You see the cholesterols in yellow. These cholesterols are going to be important in keeping the cell membrane fluid. Lots of times the cell membrane structure is referred to as a fluid mosaic model. That's because it needs to be able to remain um, able to move as it needs to. And so at high temperatures, if it's exposed to these, the cholesterols will decrease that membrane fluidity. And so it would actually make it more rigid, rigid. But low temperatures, it doesn't have to worry about because that cholesterol will keep it from becoming a solid. So it does keep it, um, help protect it, kind of like an antifreeze there. So cholesterol is going to be more common in animals, but you will find some in plants. There are some plant cholesterols. Carbohydrates are going to be found on the outsides of the cell as well. Lots of times they are attached to proteins or they're attached in with lipids and they can have those attached to them. They can act as recognition or they can act as just simply part of the cell. So they include complex molecules like proteoglycans, glycoproteins, and glycolipids. Collectively, like we said, they are going to form molecules that are going to form what's known as a glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is going to have the following functions. It helps with lubrication and protection. It helps to anchor, also can help with locomotion, and it will help with cell recognition. So there again, it lets the rest of the body or the immune cells know that, hey, that cell belongs there, kind of like part of its fingerprint. And it can serve as receptors to help bring certain substances into that cell. And so here's just a look at some of these different things that we just talked about that are embedded within that cell membrane. So the cell membrane is not going to just be made up of phospholipids. You're going to see all these other things attached to it. Next, we're going to cover intercellular junctions. And these are the ones that we're going to find in animal cells because animal cells are somewhat different than plant cells. So first we're going to have what's known as the tight junction. The tight junction is going to be important because it fuses membranes of adjacent cells together. Next you have desmosomes. These are going to fasten cells together in strong sheets, kind of like uh, cell rivets or spot welds. Next you have what's known as a gap junction. These are going to form cytoplasmic channels between cells. These are going to be very common in embryos and in heart muscles, places that need to send signals across very quickly and get their message across to other cells. You have what's referred to as a hemidesmosome. Hemi means half. And so this is going to be half of a desmosome that's going to anchor cells usually to a basement membrane. And so looking at a picture of these, this one shows you all of these different ones. So you see the tight junction. Tight junctions are very important because they make things waterproof, hold them together very well. You see the um, desmosome. These are going to hold cells together. You see the gap junction, which are going to be little channels between the cells, which will be able to send chemical signals or electrical signals between that cell. And you see the hemidesmosome, which is usually going to be found at the bottom. That is attaching it to some sort of basement membrane or extracellular matrix. Now we talked about that fluid mosaic model. That is going to be the membrane. Um, looking at it, it looks like it is fluid, kind of like salad oil. 
It's made up of that phospholipid bilayer and all those proteins that are going to be embedded within that membrane. And so here is another picture of that cell membrane. You got your hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends. The hydrophobic goes through the center. Hydrophilic's on each side. Now that's going to be very important because inside of the cell, it's going to be mainly made up of a fluid called cytosol or cytoplasm. And since that fluid is going to be a water base, then you're going to want your hydrophilic heads or hydrophilic phosphate glycerol heads facing towards the water. Also on the outside of the cell, you're going to find an extracellular matrix, which is usually going to be a water base as well. So that's why both of these sides of the cell will face on the outer sections in order to be able to interact with that fluid. Now the inside portion is going to be the hydrophobic portion, and that's going to be made up of those lipid tails. So how do substances enter and exit the cell? Well, the cell membrane is going to be what's referred to as selectively permeable, or you might have heard semi-permeable. This means that it only allows certain things into and out of the cell without any help. So it's permeable to hydrophobic substances, but not to hydrophilic substances. So things such as different lipids and cholesterols are able to make their way through that cell membrane and into the cell without any help or out of the cell. But if it's going to be a hydrophilic substance or a water-based substance, it's going to need some help. So it's going to get that help usually from a protein that's going to be embedded within that cell membrane. This is where the transport proteins come in. So these are going to be used to bring those hydrophilic substances in. Passive transport is a type of transport that does not require any type of energy or any ATP. And so a form of this would be diffusion. And that's going to be when a population of molecules moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So usually their concentration will be higher on the outside and it's going to make its way in. Or if it's higher on the inside, it'll make its way out of the cell by crossing that cell membrane. Here you can see how you have a lot of molecules of dye on one side you have the cell membrane and then water on the other side. Things like to be equal. And so usually they'll move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And then once they become equal on both sides, then that movement stops. And so you see on the top where that um, dye is going to diffuse across the cell membrane until the particles are going to be equal on both sides. Below, you see the diffusion of two solutes. And so solutes are always going to diffuse across, so it likes to go from area of high to low, usually. And so here we have the um, purple on one side and orange on the other, and they're going to want to become equal on both sides. And so what's going to happen is the purple diffuses across to the right-hand side, and the orange will diffuse across to the left-hand side until both become equal. And this, sorry, this will happen in things like carbon dioxide, um, oxygen, and hydrocarbons will diffuse this way. Osmosis is going to be a facilitated diffusion, and osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. So water crossing that cell membrane. CM is, stands for cell membrane. That's abbreviation for cell membrane. Right. So water is going to move from an area of lower solute to an area of higher solute. So always remember, water follows the solutes. So the solutes are going to be the dissolved particles or the substances in there. It could be salt. Salt would be a solute, so water is going to move towards it. So if there's more salt on the outside or extracellular tissue, then the salt's going to move, or the water, sorry, is going to move from the inside of the cell out into that tissue. And that could cause swelling within the tissue, which is known as edema. It's going to be facilitated by protein channels, and these protein channels are created by what's known as aquaporins. And so here you'll see a structure. You have a hypotonic solution and a hypertonic solution. So hypo means it has less particles. Hyper means it's going to have more particles of solute. And so notice how the water wants to follow the solutes. So the water is going to move towards the area of higher concentration of those particles or those solutes. So notice how the water becomes lower on the left hand side as it's moving to the right hand side because of all of those particles of solute that is trying to follow. So always water always follows solutes. Remember that.
So with solutions, when comparing two aqueous solutions, three states can be observed. You can have what's known as a hypotonic solution. That's a solution with a low solute concentration and greater amount of water. You can have a hypertonic solution. That's a solution with high solute concentrations and less amount of water. And then you can have what's referred to as an isotonic solution. And that's where basically they're equal. The two solutions have equal solute concentrations and equal amounts of water, so neither's going to want to go either way. So here looking at the isotonic with a red blood cell, that's when a red blood cell is in complete homeostasis. The solutes are equal on the inside versus the outside, so you have a healthy looking red blood cell. A hypotonic solution is when you have more of the solutes on the inside. So the solutes are going to be these pink particles. And so notice pink particles are only on the inside of that cell, that red blood cell there. So it's going to cause the rush in of water molecules, which are the blue. So all those blue are rushing in and they're causing that red blood cell to blow up like you're blowing up a water balloon. And eventually it can rush into the point that it causes it to burst. That's known as a lysis or lysing when it bursts. You can also have what's known as a hypertonic solution. So notice that there's more solute particles on, in the water on the outside of that red blood cell. So it's going to cause the water that's inside the red blood cell to come rushing out. And so as it comes rushing out, it's going to cause it to shrivel up. And that's referred to as it being crenated or crenate or crenation. So it's being pulled out or the water's being sucked out because it wants to go towards the solutes. And so therefore it is shriveling up. Osmoregulation is going to be control of water balance by organisms, so it's going to be very important to be able to regulate the water concentrations in different tissues and different parts of the body. So what type of solutions are IV fluids going to have and why? Well, IV solutions are going to be an aqueous solution, which is going to be about 0.9% sodium chloride, and some IVs even have a dextrin in them. Next, we have what's known as facilitated diffusion, and this is when it's not with water. So you're going to have different proteins that are going to help out um, for other substances other than water. So channel proteins are going to be um, some that are going to open and close in response to a stimulus. You have carrier proteins, and so some of these with the um, channels you see on picture A, that's going to be the one that is going to be bringing these particles in, and usually the particles have to fit through a certain channel. It will bring it in if the concentrations are lower on the inside versus the outside, so it brings it across. Then with picture B that you see, it's actually going to be bringing these molecules in. It has to have a specific shape and specific type, and it's going to fit in there perfectly in order to bring it in across that membrane. And again, this one's going to go usually from areas of high concentration to low. So looking at these, you have your extracellular fluid, which is outside of the cell. You have the intracellular fluid, which is the inside portion of the cell. So if it's looking at these different proteins that are helping, if it only brings one thing in, then that's going to be referred to as a uniport, and it brings it in in one direction. If you have one thing that brings in several different things at the same time, that is referred to as a symport. And if you have something that brings one thing in and pushes one thing out, and it can do it at the same time, that's referred to as an antiport. Now, both the symport and antiports are referred to as co-transport proteins. Next, we have what's referred to as a primary active transport. This is going to describe when a cell um, uses its own energy to pump things in and out. Things such as ions or molecules that need to cross that cell membrane against a gradient. So if it's going against a gradient, lots of times it's already going to be higher inside, but it's going to want to bring more in. Or it will be higher on the outside and it will want to push more out. So it's going against its concentration gradient. And in order to do this, it does require energy. So it's going to require our energy molecule called ATP. This is going to help maintain or change membrane potential. That's going to be important in order to control voltage of cell interior compared with the um, extracellular matrix. So this will help bring things like um, cellular signals across. 
And that's going to help with what we know as the sodium potassium pump. So here we have binding of cytoplasmic sodium to the protein that stimulates phosphorylation by ATP. And so then that phosphorylation is going to cause that protein to change its conformation. And then that conformational change is going to expel sodium to the outside or where the extracellular fluid is and binds to potassium. When it binds to the potassium, it's then going to trigger the release of that phosphate group and it's going to bring that potassium into the cell. So loss of the phosphate restores the original conformation and then potassium released and sodium sites are going to be receptive again and then it can keep repeating itself. So can basically, in short term, it's going to bring potassium or sorry, sodium out and bring potassium in. Right? And so here this shows you different types of cell transport. So you have simple diffusion where it's just simply going to cross the membrane. Remember, it has to be a lipid in order to just cross the membrane with no help. And that's regular diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is going to bring it across the membrane, but does require a specific type of protein to do this. Both of these are going to be passive transport. That means they require no energy. Next, we have the active transport. And if you see this, it does require a specific protein in order to bring these substances in or out of the cell. And it also does require ATP or the energy molecule. So transport of large molecules is usually done through a process known as endocytosis. So that's the bringing in of large molecules. Types you can have are going to be phagocytosis, that's often referred to as cellular eating, um, or pinocytosis, and that's referred to as cellular drinking. The next type is going to be cell-mediated endocytosis, and that occurs when the molecule is going to bind to a specific receptor that's going to be found on that cell membrane. And so here's an example. We have the phagocytosis. That's where that food substance will bump up against the side of the cell membrane. The cell membrane then starts to wrap itself around those food molecules, and it creates a nice little vesicle or bubble for it. And that's going to be referred to as the food vacuole once it wraps itself around and brings itself in. If it is a liquid substance, the same thing occurs, except for this is referred to as pinocytosis instead of phagocytosis. And so it wraps around the liquid substance, makes a nice um, vesicle, and brings it into the cell. Now from this point, it's going to take those things to whatever portion of the cell that need it, usually the mitochondria. And then the bottom one is the receptor mediated um, endocytosis, and that's where it has specific receptors that are found on the outside cell membrane. Those receptors bind with a receptor molecule. That molecule then allows it to start to create that vesicle or an indention, which is going to bring that substance into the cell. Once it comes into the cell, notice that it will be still covered in its own membrane bound structure. Exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis. Endo is bringing things in, exo is taking things or pushing things out. So this is the release of molecules outside of the cell. And so looking at this, you see how um, proteins will be made at the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or it could be some other substance made there. It's then going to go to the Golgi apparatus. That Golgi apparatus is going to modify it and sort whatever was made. Let's say it's a protein. Once it sorts it, modifies it, activates it, it surrounds it with a vesicle, sends it to the cell membrane where its vesicle membrane is going to um, go and bind with the cell membrane. As it does it, it will push that substance out of the cell. Transcytosis is going to be transporting substances in, through, and then out of the cell. So they'll come in through the side, they make their own vesicle, after they make their vesicle, that vesicle then travels through the cell and then gets pushed out on the opposite side. Lastly, we talk about cell division. Now, with eukaryotic cells, they go through a cellular division process called mitosis if we're talking about somatic cells. Somatic cells are going to be any body cell, so any cell that's within your body. Meiosis is going to be a, another process, and that occurs only in reproductive cells. So it only occurs with the sperm or with the egg. 
So with mitosis, it will have two sets of genetic information. It's going to have 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 from dad. And so chromosome one, you'll have one from mom, one from dad. Chromosome two, one from mom, one from dad, and so forth. So 23 pairs. Once they start to divide, that cell is going to make two daughter cells. So the original cell that starts to divide is referred to as the parent cell. The two cells that end up at the end are going to be called daughter cells. And it goes through a process called PMAT for short only once. And so with that PMAT, that's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, then it splits apart at cytokinesis, and then you have two daughter cells. With the other type, which we refer to as only occurring in the gametes, which is going to be the sperm or the egg, these are referred to as haploid cells. So it means that you only get 23 chromosomes in these. And it could be a mixture of that person's mother and father's um, chromosomes. And so maybe out of the 23 chromosomes that make it there, let's say 10 came from the mom and 13 might have come from the father. Or it could be divided anyway. Depends on how that body just randomly assorts them. All right. So haploid is going to be half the genetic information. So 23 chromosomes in all. One parent cell is going to go through two sets of division or two PMATs. And in the end, you end up with four total daughter cells with 23 chromosomes each. So looking here, this is going to be with mitosis. The cell spends most of its life in what's known as interphase. Interphase is divided up into three specific phases, kind of four. So the G1 phase or growth one phase is going to be when that cell does its job. Um, it has its cellular contents, excluding chromosomes that are going to be duplicated for later on if it decides it wants to go through mitosis. If it just wants to do its job, it will stay in what's known as the G0 phase. So that's called a cell cycle arrest. That's when the cell simply is just doing its job. Some cells never go through mitosis once that organ is permanently formed. Those cells are going to be things such as the heart cells. So they would stay in the arrested phase, or G0. G1, doubling up the different things that it needs in order to go through mitosis because it's decided it's going to, going to divide. Then it will go in what's known as the S phase. S phase is going to refer to as synthesis phase. This is where it's going to double up on its DNA. So it goes from 46 chromosomes to 92 chromosomes total. Then it goes into G2 phase. The G2 phase is where it's going to double check and make sure everything's duplicated properly and it has everything that it needs in order to divide. Also make sure that any repairs that are needed are taken care of and it makes more cytoplasm so it starts to enlarge. From that point after G2 or growth 2 phase, it then goes into what's known as mitosis or the mitotic phase or M phase. It starts out with inter, or not interphase, starts out with prophase, and then goes into metaphase, and then anaphase, telophase. Then when the cytoplasm divides and the two cells pop apart, that is referred to as cytokinesis. So this is looking at um, animal cells. And so you see the interphase, that's when it's just pretty much doing its job. Prophase, when those chromosomes have condensed and you can now see them inside that nucleus, and you see that the centrioles are starting to go to each side. So those two little pink spots on each side are gonna be these centrioles. Metaphase is when those chromosomes line up across the equator of the cell. You see the centrioles have produced spindle fibers, which are made up of basically cytoskeleton, microtubules, and microfilaments that are coming out, and they're gonna to attach to the centromeres of those chromosomes. Anaphase is when they start to pull them apart. So it's attached to the centromere and it's going to start to pull them to either one end or the other end. So it pulls them towards the poles. Early telophase, you see them going towards the poles. You see a start of an indention. That indention or pinching in is referred to as a furrow or a cleavage furrow. So it indents and eventually late telophase it starts to pop apart and you end up with two daughter cells at cytokinesis. That's going to finish us up for the cell biology and cell functions. I will see you next time with our next set of notes.